If there was a generation gap or culture gap, grandma's food closed it. Memories of her are still attached to taste and smell. The fragrance of molasses cookies, Christmas tamales, or the smell of lard frying potatoes, beans, or chili rellenos can summon grandma's stories immediately. Ignacio and Juana Gonzalez, my grandparents, came from Mexico, the place where story rose from the ground and took flight. Grandpa is from Sinaloa, Grandma from Michoacan. They never met in their home country. Since they were born 988 kilometers or 614 miles away from each other. It was the early 1900s and Mexico was in turmoil when my grandparents came to the United States. They belonged to a people who had no written history, no rights, no deed, no title to the land. As sustenance farmers, they grew up working hard and on more than one occasion had to scratch the ground in order to find little bits of food. They both narrowly escaped death and starvation. They crossed into this country separately, each carrying flimsy work permits to allow them to enter the legendary land of plenty. They worked the fertile soil they made the soil fertile. Neither had much formal schooling, but they were expected to know everything. Their language and traditions were not tolerated in this new land, but because of the tenacity of story, they persevered. And they are here, alive in this story. Family lived in Michoacan, in the hill country, and she used to say Villa was on this side and Carranza was on this side, but she didn't know who was who. I mean, soldiers used to come through the villages just to find young girls, just to pillage whatever they had for food, and they would hide. So they hid in all these different places, and she's in the middle of telling me this story. My dad had to dig a hole in the ground, Grandma said. Then he put a lid to cover that hole. When, he, when we got in, he put the lid down, and then he spread around some grass on top of that. It looked like nothing was there. He told us, honey, when they come, you get in the hole if you don't have a chance to run away into the mountains. Sometimes the horsemen came too fast, and sometimes there was no time to get away. One time, we hid in that hole all night. They came to the ranch and we stayed there until they leave. When daddy opened up the lid, he said, okay, come out, come out, everybody's gone. We came out and mama started looking for the food, but there was nothing. They took everything and they left us with nothing. So my daddy said, well, I'll go see if we can find something to eat. And he left. Oh, we were so hungry. He came home later, but he didn't have anything. We were so disappointed. I asked Mama, didn't he get anything? She looked sad, but she said, well, honey, he couldn't find anything. What can we do? We were always hiding from the horsemen, hiding in the mountains, hiding in the river, and hiding in that hole. On the recording, Grandma lowered her voice and said something quietly to my cousin, Doreen. One time, we didn't have a chance to hide. They come and they take away my sister, Maria. They take her away, poor thing. Grandma rarely talked about the circumstances surrounding her sister Maria's kidnapping, but she always told us it happened, the most painful proof of the war. Even when it was time to share the details of her sister's abduction, she stopped talking. Even on her recorded interview, she only offered that one sliver of information. One time, we didn't have a chance to hide. They come, they take my sister, they take Maria, and they take her away for a thing. So we would kind of try to ask her about this, and she never told the story. So I contacted my cousin Esther, who is Maria's daughter, and this is Esther's account. 
Oh yeah, Esther said. That was during the Mexican Revolution. Tijuana and my mom were really young, about nine and 11 years old. Their dad and brothers were off somewhere. I don't know where they were, but they weren't at home. Their mother, Vicenta, she got really sick with a fever and the only way they could make the fever to go down was to put wet towels on Vicenta's head. All day long, mom and Tijuana were doing this, but Vicenta's fever wouldn't break. Her temperature was so high and she was getting delirious. Mom, mom said that they used to live in a little house like an adobe shack with no amenities and they were running out of water. Neither of them were supposed to go out because of Pancho Villa's revolutionaries. My Tijuana, I loved her so much, but she was nothing like my mother. She was so scared. She didn't, she knew she couldn't go out and get more water. My grandmother's job was getting the water because the well was in the village and mom was a great protector of Tijuana. So she went to go get the water. Well, mom ran to the well, Esther said. It was getting dark and while she was getting the water, she heard the sound of hoof beats. She knew the horsemen were coming, so she hid behind the well. And of course, the men found her there. There were about six or seven revolutionary soldiers who grabbed her up and took her. Wow. So if you want to read the rest of that. A fugitive of the modern world, she's tired of deep lies and anthems, the marble limbs of statues on the ground. Where smoky skies and raised mountains and eagles shroud angry riots in town, she craves the peace of forest creatures. Imagining a fourth world, the rustle of wild grass beguiles her. The animal inside teaches her to have visions. To watch her signs. Night moves through her, breathes and stretches, a cold nose touching her, Stretching, matches the mouse from the cat's mouth, sets it free. Antlers shadow the sky, she hurts a beautiful pain. She molds her former selves for a furred face, nostrils mm -hmm. slanted. At the crest, she stands doe like, pillows in place awaits the balloon to cleanse the alien earth. <laughs> Traveling Oaxaca, in this land of phantasmas, city of plazas and Zocalo, I entered the courtyard of Casa Pachita, her pure bird song of the primavera, my room among jacaranda and bougainvillea. Sitting on a bench in Parque Llano, my hand smells of the street dog I fed my last piece of bread. His eyes follow me, his cold nose pokes my hand. Even the pigeons think I have crumbs. They flap their wings, they converge, they coo, and fly off when I wave my arms to celebrate the emptiness I will fill with this bright day. In my travels, I search for leaders, follow the clap, clap of the moon, and find men with indigo thread. I circle the plaza, walk down Morelos, find hidden shops that find artisans, hear cathedral bells covered, kitchen pot, the voices of saints. In the Rufino Tamayo Museum, the Zapotec warrior contemplates defeat. Nearby, a goddess with stone breasts. Roaming Zachilla, I meet a lost angel named Jose. He hovers over the poor, the forgotten dogs, then wanders the cemetery. Back at Casa Panchita, I listen to rain fall in the courtyard hear seeds snapping in wet soil, my body like an unearthed new stone. The ocean spread dark and cold beneath the night, 
reached with empty weight, the rocks of light shed by the moon, musky air and the ghosts rattle through banana leaves. You rose up bones of family architecture, luminous. A woman without soil, you carved roots mm. from the stones of the island. Into the Azorian sea you dove, the splash of your body, and I jumped, scattering stars to pull toward you. Mm. Where ocean and sky met, you vanished. Your memory, the afterlife dissolving, all that salt seeped back into the sea, an ocean mist without end. Mm. I held my breath, heard the heartbeat of waves, felt the ocean of my blood. My body took pleasure in forgetting gravity, the need for breathing on my own. I asked God to throw me a line. Floating to the shore, I felt the pull of the universe slow everything down as heaven pulled the earth into its arms. Paul Scattering. When Joe placed his hand in the cardboard urn, placed his fingers on the ashes of his wife, then released her salty great essence to the meadow. There was the truth. This was the most intimate they'd been in 45 years. Parts <laughs> <laughs> of Marianne landed in clumps in the dry dust of late summer. Oh, no. Some ash was caught up in a breeze, and he wondered if speckles might lie on the climbers over their ascending half zone. <laughs> the urn was in the green nylon backpack he'd received free for his donation to Sierra Club. <laughs> Would <laughs> dribble into the backpack? Should he then burn it? <laughs> Would she keep commingling with every element? He felt in some ways like Johnny Appleseed, sowing Marianne across Yosemite. <laughs> Yet knew the awkwardness of his distribution, the irregularity of how she spread out. The small, gritty bits caught at the edge of a leaf, some smears of her on his shoes and knees, the taste of her in his mouth. It was a mess, truly a mess. He could almost hear her voice. Here, Jerry, let me do that for you. Oh. <laughs> One of our yearly visits called Rio Nasas on our visits to El Norte every year. That's the title. It's our summertime trip. We come to see you, Rio Nasa, in El Norte, Mexico. Dumping your dark waters on the sides of this crusty brown land that you eat at with your swirling black sand like a blender. Sending your particles inside my ears, I purge, I spit you out as I try not to drown in this dark brown whirlpool. Clarity comes and goes all around me as I tread in the turbulent water after being thrown from a swing. I smile at my family anyway. No one notices that you can't see inside this water, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> I start to remind myself that you don't see rivers like this in California. Most of them are clear up in the mountains except for the LA River, full of floating shoes, carpets, and magentics. <laughs> Half of my family here, south of the border, is having an amazing time. The other half live farther south in Tenochtitlan, the land of emperors. For now, I remind myself that I am grateful. It's another summer. It's 1976, and I am 10. Where my mama's gift to us is to know our Coahuitense blood, why the people of the desert can do anything. They are superhuman. Because of this tempest, they swim in. Because of this sun that beats the demonios out of you. Because of the sandstorms. They, they, that give us 15 minutes to close all the windows down. The sandia crujiente mojada will make me forget about my hunger. When it cracks open as it jumps on the ground. Lets out its red fertile juice onto the tan silky sand below our dirty feet. 
This play of land and humans, if they would come to Cali, they would go get melon at the supermarket, <laughs> get in the water at the old crusty floor pool in Lincoln Park, where the statue of La Llorona is still there, an old beauty missing her arms with a baby apparently needed more by the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this is why we went there, gracias, mamá. Because I am a splinter from these beautiful people, my ancestors, the ones that came from the mixture of Rio Nazas mm. and this desert full of red dirt and short cactus with hanging prickly hairs. The Coahuilenses give away their worries when they swim and frolic here. I see what makes them happy, so I make it make me happy. We come back to the river once a year so that it swallows me as I sit there in shorts and a tied up blouse, my hair tangled wet. I look down and think of the rest of the demonios they speak about. <laughs> Hope they would be swallowed by the dark, dark twirl and the monster fish which we will have for lunch <laughs> near the open lands of Durango. In a beautiful place, the land of the Mexica. I hope it's this fun with my Aztec cousins down south. Well, I imagine one being flung from La Piramida del Sol in sacrifice. Do I carry that blood too? For some odd reason, the songs of the ice cream truck, Mercury and Huntington, on Mercury and Huntington, are then heard in my head. I know that I am certainly de aquí y de allá. Damn, this makes me smile. Aww. Thank you.